Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining today's webinar. We're so excited to have you here and kick off our kind of game show themed webinar and do something a little bit more fun and exciting today. Um, so before we get started, just wanna go over a few housekeeping announcements. Um, the first is just a really popular question. Will the webinar be recorded? The answer is yes. So we'll be sure to share the recording with all of you as a follow-up afterward. And the on-demand recording will also be available on the Fair Market website for those of you that want to share the recording link. Um, secondly, you'll notice the GoToWebinar control panel that appears on the right-hand side of your screen. There is a Q&A option in the webinar, so if you hear something that prompts a question for any of our presenters today and you want to engage, please submit any of those questions in the control panel, and we're going to have a Q&A section at the end of the presentation. And we also want to make sure that this conversation is really fun and engaging, so you'll notice that there's a chat option as well, and that chat is open to everyone on the webinar, including our panelists. So feel free to engage in the chat during the webinar. And we're also going to be sharing some polls throughout the discussion to get your input. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin, who is our host today, and let you jump into today's topic, The Priority is Right, Tackling Tailspend, Talent, and More. Take it away, Kevin. Thank you, Katie. So as everyone probably understands, we are far into work from home, and we thought we'd try to have some fun and go out on a limb here uh, and make this a little different than most webinars. So we're doing the priority is right. Uh, we've had some incredible people that have agreed to join us today. We'll announce our contestants in a second. But first, to get to the agenda, we'll do introductions. We'll go around the horn. We're going to talk about procurement priorities and investments. We have a great study from WNS that's going to walk through uh, the output of a survey that was done recently. We'll talk about stakeholder alignment, tackling tail spend, uh, talent management, the final showdown, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with that watches the prices right. And then we'll do a live Q&A uh, to set the table. We're doing polls, we're doing surveys throughout. There might be issues, there might be glitches. Just a heads up, once again, we're trying something new. So let's kick it off and give it a go. We'll first meet the contestants. Usually we pull them out of a crowd, but I'm going to just go around the horn. We'll have Karen start. Uh, we'll go down the, the line with your name, role, company, and then one word describes procurement in 2021. Thank you, Kevin. I'm so excited to be here. Yay. Uh, that was my prices right um, act. Oh, I don't yeah. think it. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Karen Webley. I'm the head of procurement at Atlassian. And um, one word is well overused, but I think it's very relevant, and that's transformation. Sounds like you're a crowd favorite. Joe Green. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I'm Joe Frederick. I lead procurement and sourcing at Snowflake. Um, been here for about a year. My one word um, for the past year is challenging. You want to unpack that for a second, Joe? Yeah, just uh, I'm not a big work from home person. And uh, I think uh, procurement is is very good at being business facing. So uh, to me, business facing um, face to face conversations are important for me and my team. So uh, challenging to say the least uh, for me, but, um, um, you know, improved as time has gone gone on. So. Sounds good. Uh, Tina, we'll kick it over to you. Why don't we do Anne and then we'll come back to Tina. Hi, um, Anne Fleischel, thanks for having me. Um, I work at Applied Materials. For those that aren't familiar, we are the world's largest producer of equipment to manufacture chips and advanced displays. Um, I have the privilege of leading our sourcing operations and center of excellence for indirect procurement. Um, our word for 2021 in procurement is innovators. Uh, uh, Tina, can you hear us? Yeah. Let's put my microphone. All you. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Woo! I'm in the price is right. 
<laughs> How's everybody doing? Thank you for your patience. Of course. We're doing intros and one word that describes procurement in 2021. Forward thinking. Love it. Do you want to do a quick intro uh, of who you are in the company? Yes, thank you very much. Tina Yoder. I'm Vice President of Procurement Services. I lead our financial services and life sciences ver verticals for business development. And I'm really excited to be on the panel today. Awesome. And I'm the host, uh, at one point beat up by Happy Gilmore during an uh, infamous movie. Uh, but I'm, my name is Kevin Frechette. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Fair Market. The one word I have is spotlight, because I think procurement really stepped into a spotlight for 2021. All right, so game one, we're doing higher or lower. Once again, uh, WNS did a benchmark survey of a lot of different questions and topics to CPOs and procurement professionals around the world. So how the game will work is we're gonna list out a stat and it'll be a percentage uh, aligned with an initiative. And the contestants will write on their board, their paper, their sticky notes, their whatever they have, higher or lower. Uh, the whole audience is gonna get a poll as well to vote higher or lower. We'll give it about 10 seconds. We'll see what everyone voted and then we'll head over to what the actual output was. So for this first one, the stat is 45% of CPOs are prioritizing stakeholder alignment in 2021. We'll give it 10 seconds for everyone to write their higher or lower. The poll's going out as well. Okay, it looks like we lost the screen, but it looks like everyone's voting right now. Katie, can you close the polls? So we saw higher was the majority of the, the votes. I think everyone on the horn said that as well. Let's see what the actual one is. 84% are prioritizing it. I would say, does that shock anyone? But seeing as everyone voted the exact same way, we're gonna go to the next question. The next question is 20% of CPOs are prioritizing tail spend management in 2021. Is that number, is it actually higher or lower? Katie, if you can open the polls. All right, Katie, if you can close it, please. We have higher, 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 and lower. Uh, the poll is an interesting one. So we had 64% said higher, 36% said lower. Let's see what it actually is. 54%, so it was higher. Uh, does that shock anyone or anyone want to talk about why that aligns with, with what their thoughts were? I know that, um, as, sorry, go right ahead, Karen. Oh, that's uh, so I was just going to talk a little bit about tail spend. And yeah, I think it's higher than that. But I still think that it's a challenge for a lot of companies, especially mm -hmm. um, when they're struggling with talent and, and being able to scale within their organizations and, and not mm -hmm. being able to get headcount. That tail spend typically kind of goes to the wayside um, when you're dealing with bigger challenges. Yeah, and I would agree with you, Karen. That's actually why I put lower, um, just to be realistic. It's it's not a high priority for us this year. It's something we're aware of, but not a priority considering the other factors that we're facing. And we have a section on tailspin, so we can all weigh into that for an open conversation as well. I think all these tee up sections. So for everyone listening, this isn't just one stat, and then we move on to the next topic. Uh, for the final one, for higher or lower, it's 87% of CPOs are prioritizing. Mm -hmm. Uh, talent management in 2021. We'll open the polls, Katie, please. All right, Katie, can we close the polls, please? Oh, it's a mix here. This is a good one. So we have higher, 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 and lower. For talent management, the audience said 59% higher, 41% lower. Pretty even split. Let's see what it actually came out to. The correct answer is lower. It's 83% of CPOs. Um, does someone want to kind of comment on that? Because I'm curious to hear, and well, I know we'll touch on talent more, but Anne, did you have some thoughts? 
honestly, the only reason is, is everything else was higher. So I assumed that you'd want to mix it up and put lower. It's real scientific. Oh, you know what that deserves? <laughs> awesome. We know what, honest, I, I assumed it was around 85%. It was probably to me like a couple of percentages lower than that. I, I am curious. I know Ann and, and Karen, you guys both have perspective on talent management and how you guys are looking at it for 2021. So we'll get to that as well. All right. For the next game, it's rank your top five investments and priorities for 2021. Um, coming from a fair market perspective, we recently uh, kind of did our own analysis of what we think is going to be critical for priorities coming up. And we had 10, but I kind of simplified them, them down to three that I thought were the most relevant not in, in our perspective. It's one that, and I said the word spotlight earlier, it's that procurement is at an inflection point. The spotlight's on procurement, they have a seat at the table, and they're being asked to look at more best and breed solutions that can start to leverage ML, AI, RPA, but not across the entire board for specific use cases that they can measure. Uh, the second one is that digital transformation, it, it'll be required to actually deliver and execute and measure it, as opposed to just put it in a PowerPoint which I think has been something that has happened for a lot of years, kind of coming up to this point. Now we're really starting to determine what is the output from this. And the final one that we feel super passionate about is supplier diversity. And the programs that are built around supplier diversity, they've been talked about a lot. I think in 2021, what you're going to see is they're actually measured. And people are really going to kind of get assessed with how are they actually doing for supplier diversity. So with that, can everyone take a couple minutes, seconds to write down what your top five uh, what you believe the top five priorities for procurement in 2021 and katie can you please send out to the audience the survey question for everyone to answer as well we'll take about 10 seconds all right katie can we bring it back please all right. We're first going to share what the WNS Denali survey said. Top five priorities: we had cost savings, stakeholder alignment, risk and sustainability, supplier management, and operating model. The audience pretty even split: 43% stakeholder alignment, 38% risk and sustainability, 19% cost savings. What's interesting is that's inverse the cost savings. Being at the bottom of this list, toss top, top of the other list. Um, curious to go around the horn and hear what everyone had. So, um, Karen, would you want to start us off? Sure. A um, little bit different. My, our number one priority, and I believe that um, for the past couple of years, it's been the same, has been in the tech investments. So, I, I, you had that um, with the uh, uh, machine learning and AI investments. Definitely, we need to go that route for more efficiency and experience for our end users. Um, sustainability and diversity, I, I, we just loop, lump them together. And uh, it's, this has become a major board initiative for most companies. So it's something that's really critical to us to do. Uh, efficiency and experience, I think that especially with newer companies and newer procurement teams, um it, it's kind of been a build as you go and the experience ends up being a little bit poor um over time and so taking a step back and, and looking at how we can be more efficient and how we can provide a better customer experience talent always on that list mm -hmm. and then uh, it kind of goes right along with all of it but it's our ability to, to scale to the growth of the company got it <clears throat> so what we're going to do, Karen, is we're going to have everyone else go. We're going to see what aligns with other people's, what doesn't. So we'll probably come back to you as well. Uh, Mr. Frederick, would you like to go next? Sorry, Joe, I'm reading your name tag wrong. No, that's okay. Um, yeah, so ours is uh, very much geared to, um, uh, we're, we're a smaller company right now and, and building to scale. So my, my number one really is building process um, to scale. And, and that means for us, um, really building out the transactional part of our business um, out of India. And then the strategic part uh, will be built out um, in those areas where we have business facing folks um, internally. So really building out those processes um, um, and to scale. And uh, my second one is investing in the right talent. Um, it's, it's very difficult 
um, to find good folks, I find it. So um, taking a lot of time and investing in talent is important to us this year. Um, building stakeholder relationships. That's uh, something we already talked about today, but it's super important um, in a company. I've, I've been at Snowflake for a year, but still obviously meeting folks and building those relationships across um, all of my stakeholders. Um, negotiate, uh, obviously, and, and savings is a big one. Um, which we've already talked about. Um, and then um, metrics, business intelligence, um, measuring what we're doing, um, how we're scaling and, and KPIs and putting those forward facing to the business. That's super important for me to um, develop and deploy this year as well. Got it. I mean, all things that there's a lot of parallels and similarities there. Once again, we'll come back to a couple of them. Uh, Tina, let's go around yeah. the horn for you next. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think uh, what we're certainly hearing in the marketplace is is around people, process, and technology. Um, so those are all critical factors. Um, what we're really hearing primarily is that organizations need to help their teams have more time to be strategic and less transactional. So if that's training um, and enablement from a people standpoint, that talent development seems to be very high on everyone's radar. Um, as Joe was mentioning, getting those processes streamlined, efficient, looking at the transactional side of things, adding automation into that, we're hearing pretty broadly. Um, and then the technology. So some companies have 25 ERP systems, literally. Um, and how do we maximize those investments? And what the organization has those are primary things that we are hearing got it so one thing that's interesting is even karen hit on like the efficiency aspect of it and using tech proficiency joe's on a process to scale like the efficiency behind that you're talking about efficiency as well um do we think the efficiency is more based around the people uh is it the process or is it the technology is there one that's higher in terms of that can make a bigger impact no, it's really a combination of those. The technology is really there to enable the people in the process. Technology is not there for itself. So really there to enable the strategy, the overall procurement and business strategy of the organization. So it's kind of at the bottom rung um, or overarching all of the people in the process piece. Got it. Anne, we could get over to you. Curious to hear your top five. Sure. Um, my, my top one is people. So both investing in the procurement team so that we can support our customers and our suppliers, but also in improving our stakeholder trust so that we can, you know, get our spend under manage, spend, spend under management, get more value to, um, to our company. A lot of thought around improving and scaling our operating model. Um, both in building out a center of excellence to help the enablement of our team to support the company, as well as risk management, as well as digital transformation. All of that to me is under operational model. Um, yeah, I would say those are the areas we're very focused on right now. So the stakeholder trust is one that, and I just wanna make sure we, we take this apart from, uh, Karen, you said the end user experience is a big one. Um, mm -hmm. Do you wanna talk about the end user experience versus the stakeholder trust? Because obviously, like two very different conversations there. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so the experience, I think, really is what people are dealing with every single day. So it could be a, um, a bad rollout of technology that's frustrating to them. It could be whatever the instructions that they're given, you know, that that it's too much or too little, um, or uh, you know, they're unable to find it find it and because of that they they don't want to work with procurement or they're reluctant to and obviously trust goes hand in hand with that so i think that once you focus on understanding their experience versus interpreting what we believe their experience is is polling them and and we just went through a uh, more than 2000 employee survey on experience alone and the insights that we got from that were were you know very eye-opening and now we're working on solving some of those challenges with the hopes that as we're solving them we're starting to build trust that we're listening and we're acting on it uh, any uh, anyone else have any thoughts on that i think it's really good to separate user experience versus trust because um to me trust is what gets you um gets you through the door um, you know, you, sometimes you have to take those smaller deals, the maybe things that 
you know, a, a more senior level person wouldn't do. But to be honest, you've got to get your foot in the door. So trust um, really can change um, change our ability to get more spend under management, get our savings numbers up. But that's that's fundamental. The user experience often is something that you are going to battle against um, around perception. But uh, yeah, they are very they're two different buckets with two different strategies you have to employ. So I have a question that we haven't talked about previously. Um, it, I mean, for all these projects, it's an allocation of time where, and obviously some of it's kind of the effort versus impact of where you're getting the most impact for your effort. Um, of the priorities that have been listed, what do you think some of the trade-offs are in terms of, okay, we can invest time here, but we'd be pulling away from here. Are there any that are like very opposite that you have to make that judgment call on? Just curious to throw it out to the group. You know, I think we're all kind of strapped for time these days in this new normal. So I talk to my team a lot about ruthless priorities. Um, if this this has, if you're working on something, it has to be something that's really going to move the needle for the business. Um, it's got to move the needle for trust. It's got to move the needle for this organization. And if it's not doing that, if it's not in our objectives, which are all focused on needle movers um, or scaling the team and operations, it really needs. We need to have very transparent priorities to make sure that we're all aligned on the big picture, the big things, um, the important initiatives. Got it. All right, we're gonna head to the next section unless anyone else wants to throw in a comment uh, about what we've been talking about. Audience seems to have liked it, we'll keep moving on. I'm trying. All right, uh, so the three topics that we have, uh, stakeholder alignment, tailspin management, and then talent. So um, these are meant to be just open discussions. This isn't the game show part of it. We'll go back to the game show at the end. Um, but just want to get kind of people's perspective on how they view this area of their job and their organization. What are some challenges maybe that you're facing and how are you working on them in 2021? Uh, so I'll pass it over either to, to Ann and Karen to start us off. Okay, so um, how has it changed in 2020? I think that COVID obviously has changed a lot about relationships in general, and uh, especially new people joining teams and working from home. It's hard to it's harder to build those stakeholder relationships. I think that it takes a lot of time and effort, and you have to be very purposeful when you're uh, reaching out to your stakeholders. And yeah, there. We're all on Zoom calls all day long, so respecting their time. And I think that that has been the biggest challenge, frankly, in increasing that stakeholder involvement on uh, sourcing events and, you know, and transformation and, and other initiatives that we're trying to push up. Uh, in 2021, I believe that we're adjusting to it a bit more than we did last year. And we're getting much better at building relationships remotely uh, knowing that we're probably not going to be back in our offices, maybe even any time this year, you know, it, 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 we're, we're pivoting. And I think that that's a good thing. It's our ability to adapt under the pressures that we've experienced in the past year. Is there anything specific you're doing, Karen, that you think might be a good best practice for other people listening to, to pick up or to think about? Yeah, so um, as a follow-on to the survey that we had done back in September, we're having more forums and uh, we're doing a lot of blog posts on, on what we're doing. So people may not necessarily want to join a meeting to hear this, but they certainly read the blog post. And um, that I think has been a big shift for us is how we communicate and doing it in many different ways, not just Zoom calls, but also um, just through Slack messaging or blog posts. Yeah, I like that. I love that you did a survey too with 2,000 people. Um, how, how was that prefaced in terms of the why around that survey to get people to actually uh, take it? Well, the frustration. I, I joined in September and the survey went out in September. On my second day at Atlassian, I was given the survey results. So um, it was very, like I said before, it was very enlightening. People were extremely frustrated and needed to be heard. And um, just that survey itself um, paved way for a lot more open conversation. So mm -hmm. I do think that that was pivotal, a pivotal change in direction on communications. I love that. I think that that could be a best practice for everyone. 
Uh, it's more just like organizing and doing something with the results is I feel like how you build the trust. Um, yeah. And w w what's your take on how it's evolved and kind of where it's going in your world for 2021? Sure. So um, I think similar to Karen and Joe, um, I joined my team and applied materials less than a year ago, I would say a few weeks before the pandemic started. And so it was a little challenging to, you know, learn the organization, kind of direct the team towards what is our new normal going to look like. And Applied Materials is a giant company. We have more than 30,000 people. It's very global, um, a lot of different processes and different systems to navigate. So, you know, for me, it was really focusing on what, what has this team been focused on and how, do, how can we be successful? And what I found is that our organization, like many, are, were, was very focused on savings. Um, but I didn't see as much a clear plan for that customer relationship management. And to Karen's point, customer relationship management during pandemic, right? That's a, that was a pivot we had to figure out. So um, our changes in 2020 were really around, you know, focusing on trust building, business alignment, clear guidelines on, you know, what it means to partner um, as a procurement, uh, a procurement person. You know, how do we listen? How do we help? How do we impact? And how do we win and make sure that our messaging um, was crisp, that was aligned, um, and very much center on a goal for us was earning that right to be called a trusted advisor. It's not something we just call ourselves. We have to earn that right deal after deal, meeting after meeting, transaction after transaction, and move our brand from you know savings or payment terms or compliance and really focus on we're here to enable you. We're here to deliver value that you consider value. It may not be savings. It might be um, you know, risk mitigation with all the pandemic, making sure we have enough PPE so that our manufacturing workers can get to their their sites, um, many other things, but just really listening. So uh, we've had Greg Tennyson on a couple of these. Um, mm -hmm. so I think most people know Greg, former CPO of Oracle and Salesforce, he's at VSP now, and that's always his number one. It's become a trusted partner and advisor mm -hmm. to the business. Is there anything you think you're doing specifically uh, that has helped with that trust, the business alignment, the partnering, that would be good. I was just trying to get like nuggets for people to take out that you think would be good. Yeah, I would say just going back to ensuring that the team is aligned on what is, how do we, what's defined as a trusted advisor? Because to your point, like a lot of people, you know, we use that as a way to get um, a seat at the table, but really being consistent on what that means. And I think for us having a strategy on, you know, I think sometimes procurement, we're, we're so eager to talk about the good things we can do, but really centering on, you know, what does the business want from us? What do they see as the value? And we start there and then slowly through, you know, each transaction show them more and more what the opportunities are with a, an effective procurement relationship. Any, um, any ch notable challenges? This is for Karen and Joe, Tina, anyone that you ran into in 2020 that you think, you know, I, I really got to tackle this one in 2021. Outside of not being able to see people shake hands, give hugs, shoulder bump, elbow bump. <laughs> Anne touched for... on it. Uh, oh, sorry, Joe. Um, I was just going to quickly say Anne touched on it on the uh, risk and compliance, but I, I do believe that COVID brought to light the urgency of implementing better solutions on how we onboard and monitor suppliers. And, um, you know, some of the biggest companies aren't, aren't even or haven't even been doing that. And uh, finding the right platform to be able to do that also addresses our efficiency and, you know, even the, the trust of leadership that we're, we're, we're doing that now, right, where we haven't been doing that previously. Yeah. Uh, and Joe, did you have some feedback as well? Um, no, I was just agreeing with um, what everybody was saying here. One of the things that our team did as well um, that was not on the docket for this past year during the pandemic was we created an internal uh, website for procurement where we're constantly putting up um, updates from our team as well as you know policy and things like that. I would have thought that it would have been pretty difficult to create the internal website, but it actually was very easy and quick as in um, we know within two or three weeks we had a website up and, and was posting things to it um, for internal stakeholders to to see what we're doing as well so 
That's a cool idea. <clears throat> Almost like an internal wind wire. Is it just like news flight, like this is what's happening, like headline stories essentially in the world of procurement? It is, and and meet the team and some changes that we have. Um, um, you know, we're we're growing pretty fast, so our policy and and processes are changing a lot. So I'm um, just updating folks on those types of things. So we had a lot of internal feedback on that. Folks liked it a lot. And you shared that you're going to be on a Price is Right Priorities Right show where the game host was going to be having a spatula as a microphone. <laughs> did that get up there? It did not make the website, Kevin. Sorry. All right, next time we'll have to think of a different game. Um, all right, let's hit the next topic. Uh, we're going to do uh, tackling the tail spend. Um, so, I mean, I, I want to kick this over to Tina first. I know she has some thoughts here. I do as well. I know we worked with Joe on it at a couple different companies. Um, to me, the, the stat of going up to 52%, um, I could see why a lot of people think like, hey, that's higher than I would have expected. Even for us, the tail spend management company, it, it's, a, it's a pretty cool stat to see how that's been tracking over time. Uh, but I'm curious to understand, Tina, from your perspective, um, why is procurement still struggling with it? Why is it still taking time for people to realize, understand now's the, the right time to dig in and just your overall thoughts on the space? Yes, thank you very much for that. And I think the 54% um, is not a surprise to us because of the questions and interests that we are hearing in the marketplace. And to your question, Kevin, why, why are companies not tackling that? Something that we hear frequently is um, that, the, that it's hard. Um, there are other priorities. I think, Anne, you mentioned that. Um, there are often other priorities that, that loom larger at times. Um, and yet um, there are some organizations out there that have some um, great tips uh, for how to tackle tailspin that has made it much more approachable and much more doable. I would like to reference um, our partner, Merck Group. We, um, the, if, if you all get a chance, Art of Procurement um, did a really great webinar on, on uh, Tom Sakali's story. He's Vice President of Procurement for Merck Group. And he did a very in-depth story of their tail spend journey. And it really, first of all, uh, so, so the problem that he faced is that um, his CFO really felt that there were too many suppliers. I mean, it wasn't even necessarily initially a savings focus. It was, why do we have 20,000 suppliers? And uh, so Tom was really tasked with diving deeply into that. Um, and so first he started small. The way he tackled that is just one, his category, one category, one site, one location um, before expanding. In fact, they were looking at a failed program that had happened in Germany prior and sort of as the dust settled, is this something we really want to tackle again when it did not work out the first time around? Um, so he really tackled that very specifically and then it goes to the stakeholder um, relationships, what Joe and Anne and, and um, Karen have all mentioned, it's communication, change management. So Tom's second priority um, or really first priority was to gain the buy-in of his stakeholders. He did that extremely methodically, going to the procurement board, so just his colleagues and his peers, going to the business unit heads, then to all of the controllers, then very methodically to the power users. And again, one category, one location to start with. Um, and then the, the third sort of leg of that stool was really regular reporting, regular communication in with the team. Um, he had roundtables ongoing on a, on a regular basis to get the buy-in um, and hear complaints. And um, the results, um, Karen, you mentioned the satisfaction um, experience survey. So at Merck Group, they did the same thing with Tailspend. They issued a satisfaction survey on the program at the three month point, so very early on. And then again, at the six month point, only 90 days later, um, which is not that much time, but dramatic improvement in stakeholder relationship with procurement on this project. So really they had those two goals in mind, not just cost efficiencies, not just reducing the supply base but making a better user experience making it easier to buy for his internal team and they really felt like they accomplished that and then of course a, a, you know procurement bread and butter they did save a million and a half dollars in the first few months of, a, of just the one location and the one site um, Mark group of course being a large organization but a lot of folks think well how much are we really going to gain from this when um, the pain may be um, worse than the benefit and Tom would say that's not necessarily the case so very interesting study um, and I encourage everyone to if you get a chance and, and we boiled it down to some short, uh, shorter clips too on YouTube. So very interesting story there. Love it. Thank you for sharing. Uh, 
Joe, curious to get your take on the tailspin management space as a whole and kind of your experience historically. Yeah, so for me, uh, folks that know me and Kevin, I think you know, uh, I'm super passionate about, um, you know, number one, showing uh, the addressable spend that's coming through us from a procurement standpoint and how we're engaged with that addressable spend. Um, so for me, it's it's all about the metrics and reporting to the to the CFO. Of course, um, he he always asks, how can we get the engagement higher? Because I'm constantly reporting, hey, we're engaged on 40%, 50%, 70% of the spend. He wants it at 100%. Joe, how can we get to 100% engagement? And so for me, it's really about um, looking for solutions out there on how to engage um, with what we're not currently engaged with. And when you look at some of the technologies that are out there and yourself, Kevin, in your space, um, there are a lot of things out there that allow you to not necessarily hire uh, 100 people to address the spend, um, but to go out and create efficiencies and automation um, with certain things that are out there and, and really be able to go back and tell the story about how we engage with that spend that we're not necessarily hiring employees for. Um, so that's what um, you know kind of led me down the path to my engagements with Fair Market um, that have turned out great. Um, but um, you know it's really about the engagement for me and my team and then showing the metrics behind that engagement. Yeah. The, um... The way you look at it, I think, is one that's being adopted more and more, where if you see in the screen right now, this is a, a fair market graphic, but it's essentially showing you have strategic spend, uh, different for every company. You have like the meat of the, the tail, the middle of the spend, which for a lot of companies is like $1,000 up to like a million dollars of transactions. And then you have the tail of the tail, which is just kind of like pass it through, like don't spend time or effort on it as much, unless you're talking about vendor rationalization. So when we take a look at tail spend and we look at our market, uh, we've been doing this now for about four years. We have 3x growth every year. We work with 50 plus enterprises, three of the Fortune 10. And it's it's not the knee jerk of what everyone thinks when they think tail spend, because a lot of times people think cost savings. How do I get to that 10x ROI? When if you really boil it down and talk about the strategic initiative and how to, and to your point, like be a partner to the business, usually the business outputs that we're talking about to start is turnaround time of requisitions. It's effort, it's like throughput of the existing team. It's the data to show risk of who we're actually working with. It's uh, supplier continuity, if we're talking about direct materials, because understanding who are the vendors we're working with in these 80% of our transactions, it just becomes super complex. And to Joe's point, you can't keep throwing people at the problem. Um, and then <clears throat> to what Tina brought up, like table stakes is cost savings. Like that, is some, someone's gonna ask you at some point in procurement, what do we save and what's the ROI? But to, uh, for all of our engagements, that layered in with the other business values has allowed us to start with this meat of the tail spend and then over time understand what more can we automate? Because realistically, for our whole approach, it's we want people on the most strategic complex challenges and working on the, the highest yielding activities and outputs. If something can be automated, then let's let's work to automate it. Uh, so that's been our approach. And uh, Tina, your example is exactly what we typically see. It's not all or nothing right off the bat globally. It's let's define it. Let's make sure we have buy-in across the board in terms of the executive alignment. And then as we prove it out, then let's show the expansion path. I just, the one thing I kind of throw out there as a clause is we haven't seen any companies that say, we want a solution for this geo or this category. For most organizations, it's we want something global. We want a unified solution for sourcing or for sourcing and tail spend. That's where we're really pushing as a company is how do you just be that sole sourcing platform? So to Joe's point, once you identified what can be addressed, it's now how much of it are we influencing and what's the path of least resistance to get there? Um, Anne or Karen, we have one more topic. I know talent that you guys really want to hit on. Um, want to head to the next one or any thoughts here? Um, I think my statement is that like, while it's not as high of a priority for us this year, I do recognize that tail spend is an area to your point of it's, it's high pain points um, in terms of the internal team as well as the user experience. And it can dilute the brand of procurement. If we're trying to win trust and get people to um, want to come and partner with us, um, their experience of a lot of small suppliers, the onboarding experience. And to be frank, sometimes risk is not well managed with these smaller spend suppliers. There's a loss of value and a lot of time from the team to manage. Um, I think as you grow larger and larger and move past some of the strategic sourcing category management initiatives that folks tend to start with, tail spend becomes louder and louder as the user experience feedback gets louder and louder. Yep, and it's gonna keep evolving 
as technology keeps evolving and people's expectations are faster, faster, faster. They want the B2C experience in B2B. Procurement wants to balance that with risk mitigation and efficiency. So that's the uh, that's the, the fun stakeholder relationships there. All right, we have, I think we're pretty much on time. We have about uh, five to seven minutes to talk about talent. Um, the question is, how is it changing in 2021 from a skill sets perspective for how you're recruiting from a re like a retention perspective? Uh, I know Karen and Ann, I'll let you guys pick who's going first on this one. Uh, I'll jump in on it. So talent, I, I feel like it's really evolved over the past 20 years uh, from procurement. So uh, 20 years ago, you know, it was very transactional and, and you were purchasing. And as um, more functions have fallen under procurement to drive more ROI to the company, that's changed, right? So now we're looking for specific skill sets not just procurement skill sets, the soft skills are extremely important. Understanding the business and understanding our own portfolios is extremely important. So you need to have that business acumen and, and not just the ability to negotiate. Um, relationships, we, we've talked about that a lot. The ability, it, it goes to the soft skills, but it goes beyond that too. It's that ability to develop those relationships that um, they are, you're seen as a pair to your leaders and other teams, and they go to you and your team because of how you're managing those relationships. Um, and some of the other things that I, I, I was thinking about earlier on this is, is really about the, the ability to get good talent. It's become very challenging. And I know a lot of us have been recruiting recently. It's competitive, it's extremely competitive. What used to be a, uh, a reasonable salary has now in some, some locations, I'm in the Bay Area, has almost doubled in the last five years. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's hard to attract talent to smaller companies. Um, especially if you don't have the strong stock options of, um, that are supplementing their, their salaries. Uh, and, and not just the full-time talent, but contingent talent is extremely hard for us to get quality talent, and especially again in the Bay Area. Do, we th do you think, are there any, this is like, if it's no, then that's fine. Are there any skill sets that were relevant 20 years ago that were super critical for procurement that are no longer relevant in terms of like, oh, this skill set, you just don't need as much anymore? I really think a lot of it's in the transactional. We're automating so much of the trans transact side that um, we're, if we are hiring talent, it's in low cost geos and it is more in a um, center of excellence or a center of scale. Yeah, I mean, that that's it's kind of what we're seeing. Um, we've had one person describe it as like, it's like assembling a football team where it's not like you need everyone that's the exact same, exact same skill sets, exact same skill traits. It's someone's really good at process, someone's really good at tech, uh, some are in the center of excellence. So it's assembling the right team versus like the perfect mold of one person in procurement and then replicating that 20 times. <laughs> yes, exactly. We don't want that. I don't want everyone to be like me, right? Or um, to just have a uh, wear a hat for a negotiator and not be able to um, understand what the business truly needs and what their priorities are. Completely yeah. different skill sets. I wanted to throw in the football reference for TB12 Super Bowl number 10. And we'll go over to you. Sorry. Woohoo! Hey, Pats all the way. Oh, yeah. no, I'm sorry. It's not Pat's. <laughs> Buccaneers. Two audience music. And pass over to you. Sure. Um, I think when I think about talent management in 21, you know, I'm really thoughtful about the pandemic, right? Um, I'm really encouraged by the vaccines and everything that's happening this year. While I'm encouraged to see that, I don't really see a future where we're going to return back to our old normal. Um, you know, everything is going to be more virtual, I believe, moving forward. So one of those challenges is we talked about building trust, building that trust virtually. It takes more work. It takes more thought. It takes more planning, um, recruiting, retention, development. All of that takes more effort so that you can have that connection um, with an interviewee, with um, a stakeholder. 
um, with your people. Um, uh, all of that is really paramount to that EQ, um, as Karen mentioned, relationship building, engagement, that's just more important than ever. Um, and when I'm looking to develop my people or um, recruit new talent, we're really looking for people with great communication skills and the business acumen, as Karen mentioned, to really drive effective, efficient, but also personal meetings. Because to be fair, relationships are at that, you know, cornerstone of effective procurement. And, you know, as you're developing people, rec like making sure people understand that, you know, everyone's really busy these days. How do we get their attention? If everyone's in 30 minute meetings back to back over, you know, growing a nine hour day, a 10 hour day, how do you ensure that you're getting their attention? So at the end of the day, they're remembering the messages, the value that you're bringing. So really ensuring that we're aligned to our customers, our stakeholders, our team member needs. And I've been thinking about this a lot because you know sometimes I get, I call it like Zoom brain, right? Um, and there's just so much going on, but you also have to look for a different set of skills now because before I could rely on running into someone in the hallway and they would trigger like, oh yes, I have to remember to make sure my team member is focusing on their strategy or whatever, but you can't do that these days. You have to be so self-managed and organized and things are just less organic in this way of working. And um, I think we have to be thoughtful and hire people with that type of mentality or be able to develop that mentality um, to have that strategy and those prepared agendas for what you're trying to learn and accomplish in, in this new normal. Yeah, I, I think that's spot on. It's a challenge. I think all companies, all departments are facing like across the globe. Uh, it's how do you make sure you're staying in front of people and keeping that unified message, which is really hard. Uh, Joe, anything or Tina, you guys are doing specifically that any like tips and tricks for the audience? I, I don't have a uh, tips or tricks. I think um, Karen and Ann did an awesome job uh, of explaining it. Uh, as I mentioned, when this started, it's, it is uh, difficult for me because I am an in-person um, meeting person and I, I hope Ann is wrong and I hope it does go back to a little bit normal um, at some point in the future, maybe a year from now or something. Um, but totally agree with how um, you're, you do have to look for folks with a slightly different skill set um, in these times than, than maybe prior. So um, agree with that. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree also with Joe and Ann and, and Karen. Um, it, the new normal, it, it just really is about. So we are a very global company, uh, WNS Denali. We have um, part uh, employees and and partners all around the world on just about every continent, and so it really is about that get communication, 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 communication. That trusted advisor piece, finding ways to be personally connected, having a personal connection. Um, I have found is just incredibly important in building that trust, trusted advisor relationship. So um, great thoughts from everyone. I hope we also go back to some in-person interaction as well. But some, it just is, some is going to stay. We, we know for sure that the world is changing, that we know for sure. Mm -hmm. I think go if ahead. I could, yeah, just to add on to that, you were talking about tips and tricks. I'm not sure if this is really one of those silver bullets, but I think as a leader modeling, and I, I need to do better at this too, but modeling self-care, I think that um, this is a challenging world right now, like um, uh, giving yourself and your team permission to take care of themselves, give themselves headspace. We talk about, you've got to you know, drive this agenda, you've got to be focused, you've got to be organized, but to do that, we all have to set limits and boundaries. Um, and just to, to fight against that pressure in today's new normal. And, you know, if we talk about Tina to be trusted advisors to the business and to be a good manager and to be a good teammate and retain and develop people, you have to practice really um, empathy and awareness. Um, people have bad days. Um, and you, in order to, to do that as a leader and as a team member and um, just, you have to be present to do that. I think that's an incredible point. Um, I think that's, I need to work on that. I think a lot of people need to work on it, but just because you get wrapped up, I think to Karen said, zoom, 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 agenda, agenda, agenda. <laughs> Great, you end the day, you like sit back. I have a five month old. 
So I just put her on my chest. And it's just like, all right, like that's my refresh for the day because she has no idea what's going on in the world of procurement. <clears throat> she does help with blogs. Uh, no, I think that's a that's a great point to, uh, to end on, Ann. Um, so we have the final showcase. And for anyone that doesn't know the final showcase, uh, we're going to ask a question. It's the closest to get to it uh, without getting going over. So <laughs> we're, the whole audience too, uh, Katie, if you can tee up the poll to go out to the audience, uh, it says what percentage of CPOs said digital is a high priority in 2021? So in, instead of a poll going out, we're going to ask everyone to type their answer into the chat box. So guess whatever percentage you think, and whoever either gets the percentage or gets the closest will win a special prize from Fair Market. Fair Market swag would be coming your way. All right, we're gonna go around the horn here. What percentage, you have to give an exact number. Uh, Karen, I have you first on my screen. 85. 85 for Karen. All right, Ann, what do you have? 90. 90. Uh, Tina, you're up next. Karen and I are gonna be neck and neck. 85. Uh, and then Joe, 50%. Yes, I put. I did, mine was a strategic answer, 50% in the chat. <laughs> you know what? I, I I like it. You should go. That's what someone throws the one percent, assuming everyone went over. Let's see. Ninety percent. So was that? Uh, Ann nailed it right there, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, Ann. Uh, you can work with Katie after on t-shirt size and everything. Um, one bonus question. So the bonus question is. What percentage of companies are allocating more resources and investments towards digital transformation? So if 90% have as a top priority, what percentage of companies are actually increasing the investment into digital? So if you guys can write that down as well. This is the audience yelling numbers to you. All right. If anyone has it in the chat, they want to toss it into. Um, let's go first to Tina. Let's go for a repeat. 85% sticking with it. I like it. Uh, Joe, what do you have? I put 75% in the chat. 75%. Uh, Ann? 60%. 60%. And then Karen, wrap us up. Okay, I'm going to really lowball it. 10%. <laughs> Let's see. I know. That's <laughs> I'm trying to win. <laughs> 31 percent oh, wow. so karen is the winner of that one so we have ann and karen i thought that was a pretty mind-blowing stat uh yeah. obviously like everyone else here did as well what are our thoughts on that anyone have any like perspective here oh yeah i, I have I mean, a I lot of perspective are um, looking to maximize their current investments that is something I hear regularly. So there's a lot of investment out there looking to optimize it. Got it. So more just like buckling down, doubling down on what you already have. Karen, what do you think? Yeah, I think that, you know, we know that technology is a major priority for most every procurement team and investments in that technology isn't just the cost, right? It's also the, the people that are going to either pivot in their current roles to utilize technology better or run the technology. And, um, you know, frankly, that's looked at as somewhat of a wash and can't you do it with your existing team? Yeah. Because you're yeah. creating efficiency, so why not? So uh, one thing that we did notice, uh, even from the fair market side, is that we did see a lot of teams that increased their digital budgets last year as well. So we did see a big pickup in digitalization initiatives for some very large organizations from the top down. So that could play into this as well as, okay, we increased it last year. We're still gonna increase it, but maybe not as much. Uh, Joe, any final thoughts before we go to Q&A to the group on the investment, this number right here? Or? Nope, um, I agreed with what Tina had said. Um, you know, if, if folks are not investing in it, um, hopefully they can achieve it in other ways that they've already invested prior years, I guess. Got it. So that wraps up 
the first ever priority of life. Uh, want to thank everyone for joining and everyone who helped out in the background. Uh, I feel like it went through pretty okay, but we didn't run into any big tech snags. Um, want to thank Katie on the line from the fair market side and the whole WNS team for helping to organize this and plan this all out. Uh, want to turn it over, Katie, do we have any questions? Uh, I'm unsure where to look for that. Yeah, we do. There's been some questions rolling in throughout the conversation. So I think we can jump right into those if everyone's ready. Um, yeah. The first one is for you, Tina. So Heidi has asked, can we get the name again on the, the TS, I'm assuming that means tail spend, um, that Tina mentioned mm -hmm. as a recommended use case to review? Yes, that was Merck Group. The Vice President of Procurement is Tom Sicali, C-I-C-A-L-E. And that is Art of Procurement. If you go to WNS Denali YouTube, uh, there, there are the video, the full length video plus some shortened versions are on the WNS Denali YouTube channel. Perfect. Thanks, Tina. Um, the next question, this can go to anyone. Maybe we'll kick it over to either Kevin or Joe. Um, a lot of tail spend occurs within T&E or P-card transactions. How do you review this spend compared to the spend occurring within your procure-to-pay system? Joe, do you want to um, take it first? Yeah, um, I know where the question's going. I think um, a lot of things, especially with um, what I've noticed at um, Snowflake and, and ServiceNow, um, what we try to do is create policy around um, what folks can do uh, on a credit card. Um, a lot of times you come into these companies and folks are buying things like software and, and other things that shouldn't be purchased um, through that process. And so, um, you know, all I'll say is, um, you know, we take a look at everything that's coming through um, um, on an expense on a credit card and, and try to create policy around it, um, you know, to kind of limit folks from doing that, to push it through a, a system that can be organized and, um, you know, in some sort of way that can be negotiated for future. Yeah, I don't know, Kevin, if you have anything to add. Uh, more so just like there's some categories that are always gonna be um, a little more straightforward to source than other ones. Usually when we kick off an engagement, we break out wave one, wave two, wave three. And then we make sure we have a very good understanding of how do we make it easy to do the right thing for the end user. Because I think to Karen's point, if you could make it more complex for an end user, you're just not going to get adoption and it's not going to be met with uh, with positive thumbs up. But if you make it really easy to do the right thing and funnel it through the path that you want, if the right process is to Joe's point, um, and you just do it in a logical way. You don't try to bite off everything at once. We've seen that be successful because as you get momentum and as you get data, that data speaks to help with further uh, expansion for a project. So Katie, we have two minutes left. If we do. Perfect. I think we have time for one more question. Perfect. Great. Um, so this is a more talent related question. For a young professional that has been successful in technology sales, but wants to transition to a career in procurement, what would you suggest in terms of education, certificates, classes, et cetera? It sounds like, and are you hiring? I am hiring, yeah. Oh, sorry, you're asking the question, are you hiring? Oh, no, I was just making a joke based off this person's clearly looking to transition in. I guess any recommendations for how, what they should be focused on or how they should develop? I think networking is really key, especially if they're in sales already. They probably are working very closely with procurement people. And I think that um, procurement geeks, as I call us ourselves very affectionately, um, we love to talk about what we do if other people are interested, right? And I think um, you'll find a captive audience um, just through hopefully good customer relationships and that networking. Um, I think that's a great opportunity for networking as well as mentoring. Awesome, thanks, Ann. We are right at two o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Wanna thank everyone for joining, everyone for listening. The recording will be sent out and hope everyone has a, a great rest of your day and a great rest of the week. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.